really great for me to be able to uh, speak at this session. I have uh, visited Bangalore on uh, on a couple of occasions and, and Bombay as well. And I must admit, I was absolutely fascinated by the science that's going on in India. And uh, as cricket is my second love, I was also, it was a great to come uh, home to really where cricket is, is one of the greatest and most exciting games. So it was great to see people playing with tennis balls wrapped with tape and and to go out and experience uh, what was going on. So it's a real pleasure to speak here today. What I want to do is give you a little bit of a, an insight into some of the things that can be done to understand the behavior of materials in three dimensions and also in three dimensions over time using advanced uh, capabilities. Many of those I will focus on are, to, are available in the Henry Royce Institute, as, as, as was said. We have a really fantastic collection of, of techniques and capabilities, but those many of these techniques are available elsewhere around the world. So I hope that um, either you will get a chance to come and visit us and maybe collaborate or, uh, or, or, or maybe be inspired to take undertake some of uh, some uh, to exploit some of the capabilities I'll be describing uh, elsewhere. So the Henry Royce Institute was set up in 2017 and it's in fact it's building our building was completed just hours before we were locked down. So we have this frustration of a brand new building uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, we haven't been able to fully deploy it. At the moment we're moving in all our kit so it's a very busy place and hopefully uh, we'll soon have uh, a full range of experiments. But the aim of the Henry Royce Institute is to connect together uh, a range of uh, facilities across the UK, uh, from uh, the universities of Cambridge, uh, Oxford, Imperial, Liverpool, Sheffield, Leeds, and of course Manchester, as well as the National Nuclear Labs and the UK Atomic Energy Authority, to be able to make, to be able to characterise and to be able to test materials quickly, and to work with UK universities, UK industry and research organisations. I just want to show you a short video of the uh, of the Royce and enjoying its building. As I say, it is now finished, but uh, here's a little introduction. The Henry Royce Institute, which is going to have its headquarters at Manchester, is 250 million of new investment in the UK's materials capability. The Henry Royce Institute has been set up to really pull together leading edge research from right across the UK and, and help turn that into real industrial productivity. It's already a partnership of nine leading institutions, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Sheffield, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College London, the National Nuclear Laboratories and UK AEA. I think the government recognised the real importance of, of making sure we stay a leading research nation and also that we pull through these great scientific discoveries into industrial application and make sure we can have really productive industries in the UK. The fact that materials underpins advances in just about all areas of society and our economy uh, is both a real advantage and it's also a huge challenge. But I suppose my real dream is that uh, we can look back in 10 years' time and say we now have a world-leading materials industry in the UK. So the Royce is really about supporting advanced materials developments and although it's founded in the UK, it, it is an international centre and I, I note that we've just started a, an interesting collaboration uh, 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 with uh, Professor Basu actually on uh, hip, hip, hip implants, uh, working with IS, ISC in Bangalore. So uh, there are real opportunities for collaboration. Critical to the work we do is the ability to be able to characterize materials across a very wide range of length scales. And we're really lucky in Manchester to have the uh, facilities of the Henry Royce, uh, the Henry Mosley facility where we can examine by x-ray materials across a wide range of scales and we can complement that with our ability to uh, use electron microscopy. 
So again, a, a tremendous uh, suite of electron microscopes. In fact, we have over 30 electron microscopes for uh, the examination of materials across a, a range of scales and environments. I, but I want to get over the idea initially that, um, yes, uh, 2D information is important, but 3D information is critical in many cases. And of course, in, in this example, it is not easy to diagnose the, the damage uh, that was incurred from this uh, from this um, harpoon uh, from a 2D image. And likewise, a medic would often, if you broke your arm, you would place your arm in, 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 in two perpendicular directions under the X-rays. And the, and the doctor would reconstruct mentally in their own mind a 3D image of the crack or fracture. Well, of course, in X-ray imaging, we don't use just two images. We would take thousands of, or hundreds or maybe thousands of images, each uh, oriented at slightly different angles, and put that together computationally uh, to produce a 3D image. And of course, because that's non-destructive, it gives you a lot of opportunities to discover materials and, and to look at them uh, uh, in, in non-destructively, but through processing or through service. In this talk, I want to cover a few different types of um, multi of, of correlative imaging. Uh, there's multifaceted imaging where we try and put together different techniques to build up a complete picture of the chemistry and structure of a material. We have the ability to go down a very wide range of length scales from the meter scale right down to the nanometer scale. And we have correlative imaging over time where we can correlate the changes that take place during uh, processing, manufacturing or during service life. And I will cover each of these in turn in this talk. So if we start with correlative imaging across multiple length scales, it's clear that all material scientists know that in order to understand materials, you need to look at a very wide range of length scales. And it's a very, uh, a very extensive hierarchy of, of, of length scales that determines properties, whether that's in electronics, where one has to go from the, the system right down to the, to the, to the uh, say in this case, the gallium nitride uh, 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 layers, um, whether it's in earth sciences, where we have we go from the kilometer scale right down to the nanometer scale in, to understand the, the, the extraction, for example, of oil from, from um, shale, ga uh, shale gas from, from shale, and equally in life sciences. And I think we saw in the talk, the beautiful talk we saw this morning uh, from Serena Best, she talked very much about understanding uh, uh, biological systems across a very wide range of scales. So, of course, not one technique will cover all of those length scales. And I'll show in this talk and introduce some of them. Uh, but we have X-ray CT, for example, at the large length scales. And we go right down to atom probe tomography at the very fine scale. And generally, as we go, as, as we increase resolution, we decrease the scale of the material, the size of the material that we can collect. But of course, we would really like to move many of our techniques towards the uh, top, uh, towards the top left hand corner of this graph, where we have larger volumes uh, analyzed at very high resolution. But as we move towards the top left hand corner, of course, the amount of data that we collect increases markedly. And we're now undertaking experiments where we may be acquiring terabytes, if not petabytes of data. So we can collect masses of data, and that's really important in terms of understanding at a multi-scale level, but it's also in terms of correlating observations with modeling. So I'm going to take an example from the work we did as when I was director of the International Center for Advanced Materials for BP. And in this case, they were really interested in understanding pitting corrosion as might occur along a pipeline. And to do to tackle this, we used a, a multi-scale approach, which is described uh, in, in this short video. The recovery of oil and gas is taking us to more and more demanding environments, just like this. In such places, corrosion can be a real issue. The problem for us is that we may have 20, 30 kilometer pipeline, but the corrosion happens in one small area. And what we really need to understand is what causes that corrosion. And so while on a large scale we see the corrosion, what we really want to know is what is causing that. And to help us do that, we need to go down in scale. In order to study the corrosion processes taking place in the flat, we need to take a journey, travelling down the different scales and understanding each process as we go. 
Imagine the flange to be the size of the Earth. To understand the corrosion processes, we must first zoom in a thousand times to the millimeter scale. By analogy, that takes our view of the Earth to a view of the city of Manchester. We have a selection of techniques that we can use, but to spatially resolve um, corrosion, we use electrochemical scanning techniques where we scan a probe across the surface and monitor at selected sites corrosion activity. The next step of our journey, we go 100 times closer to the 10 micron scale. This is equivalent to moving to the square in which the ICAM building is located. By using X-ray computer tomography, we can look actually uh, non-destructively at the nucleation of uh, local corrosion sites. And then we can do this actually non-destructively over uh, different time periods and can look at, at uh, different stages of, for example, corrosion or cracking. In the next step, we move in another 100 times to the 100 nanometer scale. That's equivalent to this shot of me here. We use a focused iron beam uh, to use the ions to eject atoms from the sample surface uh, and cut the sample in nanometer resolution slices, successive slices, and we use these successive slices to compile them uh, to make a 3D reconstruction. So overall, that's equivalent to zooming from the Earth right down to this grain of sand. So the scanning transmission electron microscope works by firing a beam of high-speed electrons all the way through a very thin sample, and we detect the electrons that have passed through the material. So using the slice that we've extracted in the fib, we're able to look in the transmission electron microscope at a grain boundary that is ahead of the preceding corrosion path. We're able to look on either side of that grain boundary and to understand how the atomic structure on either side determines the structure of the grain boundary. And we're also able to analyze at a very local level, just at the nanoscale, the types of elements that might be segregated or depleted along that grain boundary. So we have seen how you can forensically peel away the different length scales to better understand the corrosion that takes place in the materials of today and provide a basis for a whole new breed of materials for tomorrow. So it's this ability to really put together different techniques. And here what we're trying to do is not just put those techniques together on different samples, but actually to study the same sample through the whole process. So that, just to give a quick overview of that, the macro scale CT allows us to monitor the pitting. So we can see the pit, pitting taking place over time. We can identify particular pits, maybe one that's growing particularly quickly. And then we can move that into a high resolution micro scale X-ray CT to study it in some detail. And then, be, be, but, but, but then we can identify that region and, and look at perhaps the front of the crack to understand well what's going on at that corrosion front by using scanning electron microscopy and cutting out that region using the fib as was described in that picture. So now we can study the uh, corrosion at the grain scale and then by using transmission electron microscopy and transmission uh, uh, Kikuchi diffraction, we can understand the nature of those grain boundaries, both in terms of the grain boundary relationships and the local chemistry to understand why are those grain boundaries particularly prone or not prone to corrosion. So I think the key point here is by putting these length scales together, each one gives us a different opportunity to try and um, to control uh, the, the corrosion process. So if we look at the, at, at the, at the, at the millimeter scale, we can use, uh, we can look at the efficacy of paints to inhibit corrosion and, and, and the use of inhibitors in, uh, in reducing corrosion rates. And we can follow that in, the, uh, in, in real time in the X-ray uh, computer tomography. We can then go down to this fine scale to study the pit, which is shown here in blue, and the corrosion cracks, which are emanating it from in red. And clearly the pit is uh, of structural integrity concern, but the corrosion cracks are much more, uh, a, a much more uh, high threat in terms of structural integrity. And we can see those uh, corrosion cracks. If we, can, if, we can, if we can control the emanation of the cracks from the pit, then we can, we can end up with a safer and longer lasting structure. 
At the next scale, we can see the corrosion is occurring along these grain boundaries, and we find that different grain boundaries are more or less prone to corrosion. So again, by controlling the grain boundaries and controlling the grain boundary structures, we have another opportunity to inhibit or to slow down corrosion. And then finally, at the atomic scale, if we can, all, if we can engineer the, the segregants to the grain boundaries, then we may be able to slow intergranular color corrosion at the, at, the, at, the, at the atomic scale. So all, by putting all these scales together, it enables us to come up with a range of mitigation strategies for preventing or slowing the corrosion process. And we can map those onto a, a technique chart, if you like. This is rather a technique palette. And we have a whole palette of different techniques, destructive and non-destructive, where we can pick out the chemistry, where we can pick out the crystallography, where we can measure locally the properties. And each experiment we, we, we embark on, we can define different workflows to uh, go down the different length scales, to look at the hierarchical nature of materials behavior to study uh, the process. So in this case, we're moving down through uh, these uh, different techniques using the gallium fib as a means of finding site-specific information within the electron microscope and uh, ultimately down to the transmission electron microscope cell. So these kind of uh, workflows can be put together for a whole range of materials behavior and manufacturing challenges. Moving on, we, we also have the opportunities to study things over time. As I said, X-ray CT is a non-destructive process and because it's non-destructive, it means we can repeatedly acquire information, either to monitor changes in real time or to monitor changes over long periods using time-lapse imaging. Here we see uh, a map of all the CT instruments or many of the CT instruments operating at synchrotrons and some operating in lab systems. And what we see is that as we go to higher and higher spatial resolution, the time to acquire an image gets longer. So we can undertake CT scans in uh, over time periods of hours or over time pe periods of seconds. But as we get to higher and higher resolution, the time scale of the experiment tends to go up. So if we want to do fast experiments, if we want to study things in seconds or minutes time scale, then synchrotron X-ray CT is particularly well suited. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So the first one is work we've been doing with Peter Lee at Imperial at uh, University College London, looking at, um, at, at, at replicating additive manufacturing inside the inside in front of the X-ray beam. So here you can see the laser is melting, locally melting a powder. And this in this X-ray radiograph, we can see the molten pool of metal. We can see the powder and we, and, we, and the laser is, uh, is indicated by this red line. And so as we look through, we can acquire images really, really quickly and study the dynamics of the, of the uh, additive manufacturing process. We can see the powder being ejected. We can see liquid metal being ejected and we can understand the stability of the melt pool. And we can see uh, some of the flows that are taking place. As you could see there, the, uh, the vault, you could see some of the flow processes taking place. So this provides us with a very quick uh, and very high, high frame rate way of um, examining manufacturing processes. And that enables us to improve the physics and understanding and to, and to optimize the additive manufacturing parameters. Similarly, if we want to study batteries, this is work with Paul, Paul Shearing at UCL. Here we're looking at high frame rates to understand catastrophic failure. So this is a battery head and you can see uh, very high frame rate imaging. We can see how uh, damage leads to thermal runaway and, and, and we end up with a catastrophic failure. So here, uh, strategies to mitigate these effects uh, can be developed. By, integrate, by, uh, by introducing extra vents to allow uh, the, to prevent the, the clogging of the, of, of the vents. So a second relief vent can significantly increase the stability and safety of these uh, battery materials. If we go on and go back to the original image, uh, the original graph, we then have for longer time span experiments, synchrotron experiments are really too uh, time consuming for to tie up synchrotrons for large periods of time. And laboratory CT is particularly well suited. This enables us to go back 
uh, and put the sample repeatedly in the CT system to monitor changes over time. So in this case, the ability to do temporal imaging allowed us to monitor the behavior of a chrysalis over a long period of time. Actually, we started by doing a serial experiment using chrysalises harvested at different times, one after one day, one after two day, one after three day. And a bit like growth in humans, it just because you, you can't necessarily take time as, a, as an indicator of progress, the, 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 the order of those were diff was difficult to, to, to ascertain because sometimes one would grow more quickly than another. By doing a longitudinal study, we were able to study the growth of just one chrysalis, and that enabled us to really uh, get much better, uh, uh, better images and better understanding of the processes as the, as, the, as the chrysalis developed over the 16 days of the pupation. Of course, one can extend this to uh, manufactured articles. Here, we can. I want you to imagine that this is an additively manufactured tensile sample. We're actually looking down through the tensile sample, and so this is the cross section. And what we can see is we've marked, uh, we've rendered in red the defects. So the red shows the defect as we look down through the material, rather as if we'd made the metallic sample, in this case titanium, transparent. And you can see all manner of different size uh, of different size voids. But what's really clever here is we've been able to do X-ray imaging of the crack as it grows. And you can see that in sample A, the crack has grown from this surface defect. And we can see over increasing numbers of cycles how that fatigue crack has grown. In the second sample, you can see that the, in B, you can see that this defect has grown, uh, has, has caused a crack from the center. And what we found is we were able to identify the um, propensity of crack growth from near surface defects and interior defects. And what we find is that near surface defects can be much more deleterious to fatigue life than internal defects. And you can see, for example, in A, that there are some quite large internal defects, and yet the crack has grown and propagated from the, near sur from the surface defect. So we're able to understand the role of defects, the distribution of defects in the material, and the rate of nucleation of cracks and, and growth. Similarly, we're able to design materials to, um, to um, overcome crack growth. In this case, we have a max phase ceramic, and we can see that at, at high temperature, the max phase ceramic will heal itself. So here's a crack in the, in the uh, ceramic, and at 1,050 uh, degrees centigrade, we can see the healing of that crack. So the crack is healing because uh, basically aluminium in the max phase ceramic is coming to the surface. It's forming an, a, an aluminium oxide, and that oxide is forming a strong repair to the crack. And if we look at that in a cross section, so this is a cross section through that image, you can see that over time, how the crack is repairing itself. And you can see a small amount of contrast here where the crack has, has been. And you can see that in this particular, in a, sm a small region near the center, a, a little bit of the crack remains because the oxygen has not managed to get into the crack region and has not healed the, the ceramic through the formation of aluminium oxide. But by controlling the composition, we can design uh, self-healing ceramics that can, can heal themselves at different temperatures and over different times. Similarly, this is a polymer, a woven polymer composite. Here we're looking at a repeating unit in a, in, a, in a woven composite, and we can see the weft yarns, and we can see the binder yarns, and we can see the warp yarns in this carbon fiber material. And the question here is how do cracks grow in fatigue? When do the crack first cracks appear? And how long, uh, how extensive is the cracking uh, before failure? And what we can see is over the many cycles, we can see that the, uh, the cracks will start to appear and grow. So first we get transverse ply cracks. You can see a number of transverse ply cracks occurring in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the carbon uh, toes that run perpendicular to the applied load. And that occurs at just 1,000 cycles. And after 5,000 cycles, we now have increasing number of transverse ply cracks, as well as some uh, longitudinal delaminations and cracks. And what we can see is over many cycles, we can follow this sample and we can see that the cracking in intensifies and such that by the time we get to about 70,000 cycles, we now have extensive cracking. 
And of course, uh, this is at 80,000 just before failure, and we can see a, a comprehensive matrix of uh, or, or a comprehensive array of cracks and, and, and delaminations, uh, which are uh, within which are constrained within the weave of the composite, but which ultimately give rise to failure at about 85,000 cycles. But the point is, the first defects formed at just 1,000 cycles, and yet we end up with a life of about 80 to 85,000 cycles. And so it's important that we understand the nature of these defects and learn how to live with them. Otherwise, we would have to uh, unrealistically cut short the life of the component. We can also understand biomedical materials. Here we're looking at a piece of artery, and you can see the artery wall label, uh, identified in gold. And you can see that in the unpressurized state and then the pressurized state, you can see how the arterial wall aligns itself. And, and this alignment is different as you grow older and as your as your arteries become less strong. We, we, we're starting to understand how these changes in structure take place. And finally, one example of a composite from nature. I just wanted to show this at even higher resolution. So whereas our composites have scales where the fibers are of a few microns and the laminates may be a few millimeters and the components may be meters, the back of a beetle is a composite material and it performs in a very similar way. So again, we can make small samples and understand how, the, how that beetle material uh, behaves under, under tension. So here we can see one ply uh, of the material and, 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 and no load and how we can see how cracks start to propagate as we increase the load and those cracks ultimately open more widely. But the reason why the beetle is so successful is because the next ply lies at about, about 80 degrees to the first. And so the cracks in the first ply and the cracks in the second ply are out of registry. And the third ply is rotated again uh, back to more or less the same orientation as the first ply. And again, we can see a different nature of cracks. So what this means is we get a, a very in, a very intense uh, clustering of cracks, but those cracks are all oriented in different directions, in different layers, and those layers then um, pull out only slowly. And so you can manage uh, stable crack growth uh, very effectively with this kind of design. And you can see the different layers in the 3D representation here with the different crack morphologies. So we can understand manufacturing, we can understand materials in performance, and we can understand natural materials. The other thing we can do is to put different, different techniques together. So what I want to show in this last example is how we can put different techniques together to get complementary information. So this is a 3D uh, in, a set of images based on butterfly defects. And butterfly defects occur in rolling raceways uh, some distance below the surface, usually about 150 to 250 microns below the surface. And you get these characteristic butterfly structures, which show cracks on the wings, and then you see white etched matter uh, and, uh, uh, forming a structure within those wings. Now, in order to study these, we had to do 3D sectioning and we had to cut away using a focused iron beam. And in this case, we used a plasma iron beam to reveal these butterflies and to understand their 3D nature. But in the, mi in the microscope, we're doing 3D tomography, if you like, by serial sectioning. And we can understand in each section uh, what is going on only by putting together multiple information from different techniques. So in the first image on the left, we can see very clearly in the backscattered electron image, we can see the cracks and the voids around this butterfly defect. The butterfly defect usually forms around an inclusion uh, of some sort. So here we can see inclusion of about five microns, which actually has just fallen out. But we can see the, uh, the cracks uh, forming these wing, these beautiful butterfly wings. In order to see the white etched matter, the best way to pick that up is to use electron backscatter diffraction because electron backscatter diffraction is sensitive to the crystal orientations. And in the very fine region of the uh, white layer, the EBSD doesn't index. And so we can very clearly define the extent of the, of, of the white etched material by EBSD. The third question, of course, is what happens to all that carbon in the carbides? And there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the carbides dissolve. And you can see that very clearly here. 
so you can see that in the in the matrix we have a lot of carbides the red areas here but in the carbon map but when we look at the at the white etched areas the white etched areas have not only dissolved the individual carbides but the matrix in the white etch zone is depleted in carbon now this was a surprise because i think a lot of a lot of people felt that if you dissolve the carbides this white etch layer would be rich in carbon but this evidence shows that actually it's depleted in carbon so in this case we have to put together three different techniques traditional electron microscopy electron backscatter diffraction and uh, dispersive spectroscopy in order to, to gain a complete picture of the process. Once we do that, we can do that by serial sectioning. And so we can get a 3D image of these butterflies where we can see uh, the separation of the wings in the white etch layer. So the white etch layer is shown in gray. The cavity is shown in blue. The inclusion at the center of the cavity is shown in yellow. And these cracks, these butterfly cracks, are shown in red. So we can build up a very complete picture of the 3D morphology of these materials by combining uh, these different techniques. So standing back, how do we take these methods forward? What we have here is, is a wonderful opportunity to put together different techniques to understand the behavior of materials at multiple length scales. One of the problems, of course, is how if you find a defect in one technique, say, for example, we, 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 scan, uh, we scan and we find corrosion, uh, we set our sites of corrosion in one technique, how do we then move that sample over to another technique to study it in more detail? Now, that could be difficult in 2D, but it's even more difficult in three dimensions. If you have defects or features of interest that lie well below the surface, how do you find where you are in the sample? So we need a, 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 what I've called a GPS system, a system which allows us to locate where we are in the sample so that we can, as we survey the sample at one length scale, we can identify regions of interest, we can mark them, and then we can go on and take images of them uh, using other techniques. Rather in the same way that if I was wandering around the streets of, uh, of Bangalore, I could take images on my camera and I could take images around of different sites in the, uh, in the markets or in the university and I could take those images. And then because the GPS has recorded my location, those could then be recorded on Google Maps or in some other way. We need exactly the same kind of technologies within the microscope so that the microscopes are passing on information from one length scale to another so that as we see regions of interest we can we can catalog where they are and then we can go back to them with a higher resolution technique it should be routine to be able to find that location whereas for many of the images i have shown you we've had to work very hard to locate and, and reproduce those multi-scale uh, sets of images so uh, the second thing is how do we store all that information? Clearly we need to, if we have a single sample, we want to be able to store all the information we have about it, uh, all the different length scales, all the different chemical information, all the different structural information, the crystallographic information. And we want to be able to put it all together to co-register it and then to co-visualize it. The visualizations I've shown you have largely been done by hand, but companies such as Thermo Fisher, Zeiss, and others are starting to integrate instruments together so that you can pass a sample from one instrument to another, rather like a relay runner would pass the button from one, one relay runner to the next, so that uh, we can contain uh, the same, we can maintain the same specimen coordinates as we move through the, through the workflow. As I said, this is tricky to do in 2D, but we need to be able to do it in 3D. And I just give you one example where that's where this is really important. And this example is taken from biology. So in this case, we have a small sample of of um, of mouse intestine. Now, the mouse intestine has whipworm. And of course, whipworm has, is, is a tremendous parasite that causes all manner of, uh, of problems around the world. But the whipworm, what it does is it buries itself in the intestine. And we know that it anchors and, and it's buried. And you can just see, if you look in the middle image, you may be able to see the outline of the whipworm lying submerged within the intestine. Now, to study that using electron microscopy is very difficult because we can't find these whipworm and we can't locate their anchoring. 
But what we can do is we can use X-ray imaging to locate the whipworm, and then we can use that information to steer subsequent high-resolution electron microscopy. And that's what we've done here. So if I move to the next image, you can see on the right, you can see the X-ray image of the whipworm in, in the intestinal wall. And on the left, you can see serial section electron microscopy of the, of the uh, whipworm. So the, the images on the right, the low resolution images are non-destructive. And of course, that allowed us to survey the whole of the intestinal wall to find the, the uh, whipworm of interest, to identify the region we wanted to excavate. And then we could transfer that to a dual beam focused ion beam microscope where we, or in this case, uh, sorry, a, a three view microscope where we could mechanically slice away uh, all the layers to reveal the head of the whipworm and the uh, local damage in the intestine. Now, this is really important if we want to develop strategies to treat whipworm, because clearly we need to have strategies that where, where, where treatments will, will be able to, will, will be able to uh, um, uh, uh, re reach those whipworm that are buried beneath the surface. So we need to understand their life cycle. We need to understand how they submerge themselves and to find appropriate strategies to treat them. But this could be equally, this could easily be a defect in an additively manufactured component, or it could be a, a, a site of concern, an electronic component. The techniques are, are important across a very wide range of advanced materials. So I've taken you on a bit of a journey today. Uh, I hope I've shown you some interesting techniques. I think, uh, so I'm sure some of them are available in your own labs and some of them maybe you may have to uh, you may have to go to other labs. But the key point is that recent advances in X-ray imaging, coupled with these correlative multi-scale techniques, enable us to put together a range of techniques to build up both a multi-scale picture of materials behavior, but also a uh, multi-modal picture. So we can bring together chemistry, crystallography, and structure. Furthermore, by because X-ray is non-destructive, it enables us not just to study a static image, it enables us to build up this picture, whether that's the healing of a biological material, whether that's the manufacturing and the processes that take place during manufacturing, or whether that's to study the, uh, the, the in-service performance, whether that's at high temperature, where there's creep cavitation, or, 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 um, or whether that's at lower temperatures where there might be fatigue or, or fracture or corrosion. So we have a tremendous set tool set now to understand a range of behaviours uh, from millimetres down to nanometers. As I said, technique manufacturers, instrument manufacturers are starting to work together to enable us to automate this correlation process. And equally, we need tools to allow us to visualise these kinds of 3D phenomena so that we can co-visualize different the image from using different techniques. We can correlate images from one moment in time with another in moment in time, and we can uh, and we can um, we can uh, merge information ac acquired across different length scales. I think type, the potential for time lapse imaging, whether that's at the nano, whether that's at the milli millisecond scale or the many year scale is now entirely feasible. For example, we've been studying oxidation of nuclear uh, pressure vessel steels over, over six monthly periods, where the sample is coming back to us every six months and we're monitoring those changes. So we can monitor both short term and long term. As I said, I hope this talk has given you a, a flavor of some of the advanced materials work we're doing. I hope it's given you some inspirations and some ideas, maybe to empower the, your own research. And of course, uh, those facilities are available uh, within the Royce Institute, but also more widely available. I hope, uh, I, I hope uh, you found something of interest, and I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. <laughs>